We turn now to First Minister's questions, and we start with question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presiding officer, we all recognise the work that is done by hard-pressed staff who answer 999 calls. But this week, we heard more evidence of things going tragically wrong. Elizabeth Bow called 999 to report a domestic abuse situation. 84 minutes later, she'd been murdered in cold blood by her brother. Yet the control room told her that they were refusing to send officers to her house. We know that this is not an isolated incident. And the question people are asking is this. How many more times will a call for help go unheeded before the situation in our emergency control rooms is sorted out? First Minister. Well, this is a, an extremely uh, serious issue and involves an extremely serious case. I think the first thing I would want to do uh, here today, presiding officer, is convey my thoughts and sympathies, my heartfelt thoughts and sympathies to the family of Elizabeth Bow. Uh, this was a tragic incident. Uh, Police Scotland has rightly offered an apology to the family for its handling of the initial call that was made. It is beyond doubt that there were significant failings here and Police Scotland uh, went out with their own procedures uh, in dealing with these types of calls. Uh, in other words, Police Scotland did not provide the response that was expected of them. That is not acceptable and it is crucial that the uh, police service learns lessons from that. Uh, in terms of Ruth Davidson's wider question, though, um, there are uh, significant improvements that have been made to police call handling. Uh, that's not just my view. We know from the update report published by Her Majesty's Inspectorate earlier this year that that's the view of the Inspectorate as well. Uh, clearly, following uh, another tragic case, there was a review of call handling carried out. That was published, I think, in November 2015. So there have been a number of improvements made and it's vital that the police continue to uh, make these improvements. Indeed, since the incident that Ruth Davidson has raised today, further action has been taken. Uh, for example, uh, the police have ruled out risk and vulnerability training to more than 800 staff. Uh, further guidance has issued to all control room staff in relation to the regrading and closing of incidents. Uh, a national quality assurance unit for police call handling has also been established. So this was a tragic and unacceptable case and uh, nothing I say today is intended to detract from the seriousness of that. But it is simply not the case to say that significant improvements are not being made uh, and have not been made to call handling. And it's important that lessons from cases like this continue to be learned. Ruth Davison. I thank the First Minister for that answer and she points to the assurance review by Her Majesty's Inspectorate that was made in January of this year in our government's defence. But let me just run through some of the 200 incidents from the last year that we've uncovered, mostly since that report was made. In one case, a suicidal man was told to hang up. In another, two separate call handlers failed to record a report of a dead body in the house. In another, uh, a couple rang 999 to report that their front door was being kicked in, but didn't get any help because firstly, the wrong address was written down and secondly, police officers weren't even dispatched. So that's the reality of what's happening right now. Does this sound to the First Minister like a system that is functioning well yet? First Minister. Well, every single one of the incidents that has been cited today by Ruth Davidson is serious and unacceptable. And as I said in my initial answer, uh, I don't want anybody to hear anything I say today as detracting from the seriousness and the unacceptability of these incidents. But I, I do think it is important uh, also to put the situation into context. Ruth Davidson cites 200 incidents, as I say, completely unacceptable. But Police Scotland handled 2.6 million calls uh, every year. And let me quote uh, what Derek Penman, uh, the Chief Inspector of Constabulary, said on this very issue uh, when he appeared earlier this year before the Justice Subcommittee on Policing. He said, uh, we must realise that there will always be risks and things will happen. Some people fail to accept that, but we need to recognise that improvements have been made and that there is no crisis in police call handling. Now, I am very clear that one incident of the type that Ruth Davidson has cited uh, here today is one too many, and lessons must be learned uh, from all of these incidents, as lessons will be learned from the one that Perk reported on this week. Uh, but I also think we need to recognise the, the number uh, of 
calls that are handled uh, and use that uh, as context, but also to recognise, again, as has been recognised by Her Majesty's Inspector, the significant improvements that have been made. Uh, the responsibility of the police overseen by the SPA and, of course, uh, with ultimate accountability of this government is to continue to make sure that these improvements are made and that all lessons, when they need to be learned, are learned. Ruth Davison. Presiding officer, we, we keep hearing that things are getting better, but time and time again, members of this chamber have raised concerns about the way the centralisation of our police force has been administered. And time and time again, the Justice Secretary brushes those concerns aside and insists that the rush closure of control rooms under his watch is safe. And yet, as I've just read out, incidents are continuing and the problem in part of this government's making are still live. The public has a right to expect better. The Justice Secretary claims that he's on top of this. Does the First Minister share his confidence? First Minister. Well, Ruth, Ruth Davidson, to her credit, is raising uh, a significantly important issue and one that is of concern to the public across Scotland. I do, however, think she uh, risks doing herself a bit of a disservice in how she's characterising uh, the approach both of the police and of the government. Uh, it is simply not true and it is not fair, presiding officer, to say that this government or the Justice Secretary has ever brushed aside concerns of this nature that have been raised. Indeed, it was the Justice Secretary who commissioned uh, the report into call handling that Her Majesty's Inspectorate carried out and published in November 2015 with the update report that we've referred to uh, in January of this year. It's also not just me uh, or indeed the Justice Secretary who are saying that significant improvements have been made. That is the view of Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary. Uh, the vast majority of the recommendations that were made in that original uh, report have already been implemented. Uh, significant action, some of which I've already narrated today, has been taken to strengthen uh, the call handling processes and to make sure uh, that the whole process is of the quality that people deserve. But I will uh, never, uh, never ever stand here and say anything other than that the type of cases we've uh, heard reported this week or the ones that Ruth Davidson has quoted in this chamber are in anything other than completely unacceptable. Uh, but in accepting that, uh, it would equally be wrong for me somehow to say that no improvements have been made. It is wrong for Ruth Davidson to say that because that is not the case. Significant improvements have been made and will continue to be made and all lessons that require to be learned absolutely will be learned. Ruth Davidson. The issues that I'm citing have happened since that report were published. So this isn't an issue that has been resolved. It is still ongoing. And we were promised, all of us in this chamber, that taking control rooms out of local areas wouldn't result in a loss of local knowledge. So let me read some more cases from this year. A woman threatened by her ex-partner who didn't get a response from police because they were sent to the wrong address. A man threatened with a knife where police were sent to the right flat, in the right street, but in the wrong town. A caller who rang as their mother and their niece were being assaulted, and again police sent to the wrong location. The Justice Secretary promised that if performance dropped at any of Police Scotland's call handling centres, there would be rapid intervention. And he made that promise two years ago. And we're still seeing hundreds of serious incidents so can the First Minister look those families in the eye and say that her government has lived up to its promise? Well, I would, First Minister. I would say to any family who has experienced uh, the kind of experiences that Ruth Davidson uh, has cited today that that is completely unacceptable. There is no uh, dispute between Ruth Davidson and I on that fact. Uh, what I am saying, I, I would uh, like nothing better, presiding officer, as First Minister, to stand here and say and to be able to give an absolute categoric guarantee that in a police system that handles 2.6 million calls every year that nothing will ever go wrong but there is no country on the face of this planet that has a government that can stand up and give that categoric guarantee however we will continue to take all appropriate and necessary steps to make sure that the system that is in place is as robust as possible and the point I am making is that there have been significant steps taken leading to significant improvements uh, since the report in 2015 and again I would say if, if it was only me standing here saying that then I guess the, the scepticism that Ruth Davidson is articulating today may have more justification but Her Majesty's Inspectorate is saying that significant improvements 
have been made and has also uh, made the point that given the volume of calls, unfortunately, and is of deep regret to everybody, there will be cases where things go wrong. Our duty is to try to make sure that that risk is minimised as much as possible, and that is what we will do. So these lessons will continue to be learned, uh, and we will continue to give our police service the support that it needs to make sure that the public have assurance that the call handling arrangements that are in place are robust. I've already quoted Her Majesty's Inspector. Let me also uh, quote uh, from uh, this, uh, this year, in fact, uh, very recently, Niven Rennie, who of course used to be the President of Association of Scottish Police Superintendents. Uh, I do know that police receive loads and loads of calls, millions of calls a year. The vast majority of them are answered extremely well, very professionally, uh, but recognises that sometimes things will go wrong. Our duty is to make sure we act in any case where that happens so that all appropriate lessons are learned, and that's what we will continue to do. Question number two, Jackie Bailey. Will the First Minister join with me in commending the bravery and courage of all those who have come forward to speak out about sexual harassment? First Minister. Uh, yes, I absolutely uh, join with Jackie Bailey in doing that. Um, many organisations, all political parties, uh, indeed this parliament and other parliaments, have had to confront some very difficult situations in recent days, but it is absolutely right and proper that we have been prepared to do so. I think the priority for all of us in this, and these are not easy situations, is to encourage women to come forward and to make sure that when women do, the environment that is being provided for them is as supportive as possible that they have confidence that they will be listened to and believed and that any concerns or complaints that they bring forward will be robustly investigated. I think that has led to all of us looking afresh at our procedures and tightening those procedures. I know my own party has done that and I know the, the Scottish Parliament is doing likewise. Uh, but we should pay tribute to women coming forward and we should encourage others to do so if they feel that's what they want to do. Jackie Bailey. Um, I agree with the First Minister on that point because it does take incredible bravery to speak out about harassment, especially when often it is a woman having to report the behaviour of a man in a position of power. A helpline is a welcome first step, but it is pointless if it doesn't ring. And it will not ring if victims don't see that allegations made are then investigated transparently. Because an absence of complaints does not mean an absence of harassment. So our response needs to go further because we know that apologies are not always enough. So can the First Minister tell us what changes she wants to see in the Parliament to create that safe space for people to speak out? First Minister. Well, of course, that's not just a matter for me. That is a, a matter for Parliament collectively. I met with the presiding officer with representatives of other parties last week where uh, we talked about the changes in procedures that the Parliament should make. I made the point at that meeting, I've made this point publicly, that changes in procedures are necessary and important, but it's the underlying culture that allows some men, and I stress some men, but it is predominantly uh, men, to behave in uh, a way that leads to uh, women feeling the way many women uh, ha have done. And we've got to change that underlying culture. John Swinney last week in this chamber uh, rightly said that it was for all men to reflect on their behaviour. And I, again, uh, would reiterate uh, that point. Um, I think in terms of the Parliament's own procedures, and I stress that uh, before the presiding officer points it out to me, that this is not uh, a matter for me as First Minister. This is a matter for Parliament. I think the situation with the Parliament's corporate body, uh, where there are no women represented on it, is unacceptable and will have to be addressed and resolved uh, by this Parliament. We are about, as a Parliament, to consider legislation about gender balance on public bodies. This Parliament has a duty to lead by example. So that's a matter for all of Parliament to address, uh, but I think I'm making pretty clear uh, this afternoon what my views on that issue are. Jackie Bailey. And again, there is much I can agree with the First Minister on, but I think we all know a woman will not speak out if she thinks she'll be ignored or if the man's behaviour goes unchallenged or simply excused as a joke. This should be a watershed moment. This is our opportunity to tackle sexual harassment in our parliament, in our country and in our society and the Scottish Parliament must lead the way. So no matter if you're a backbencher or a minister, no matter whether it is at Holyrood or Westminster, sexual harassment needs to be challenged and challenged transparently. First Minister, if the standard of behaviour is not good enough for someone to remain as a minister, then how can it be good enough for an MSP? 
First Minister. I, I mean, obviously, uh, Jackie Bailey is referring to the, the situation of Mark McDonald. Uh, Mark McDonald did what John Swinney had asked all men to do last week and reflect on his behaviour. Uh, he uh, came to the conclusion that that behaviour, whatever he might have thought of it uh, at the time, uh, was behaviour that was not appropriate. And he did, in my view, the right thing by uh, resigning. Let me uh, be clear that uh, that, that behaviour was about language, not physical conduct. Uh, and while I think it justified the step Mark Macdonald took, uh, let me also make it clear that it was not uh, language that would come in any way close to being something that would require to be referred to the police. And I think that context is important. There's also another point here, presiding officer, uh, because I agree with Jackie Bailey, 100% uh, actually, on the, the point that women will not be encouraged to come forward if they don't believe they will be taken seriously if uh, the behaviour they're complaining of will simply be dismissed uh, or they feel they will be ignored. But I think there's another issue here, and this is particularly relevant to politics, and it is particularly difficult, I think, for politics. Women possibly will also be discouraged from coming forward if they think that the moment they do, every aspect of what they are uh, raising as a concern will be all over the media. And in that situation, uh, I think we would... Uh, unintentionally give politicians perhaps more protection than others uh, in society and that's not what any of us want to do. So that supportive environment that we want to create for women coming forward also on occasion has to involve respecting the confidentiality and the privacy of the issues that women are raising. And that will mean sometimes we have to find balances in these things that are not always easy for those of us standing up in parliaments explaining. Uh, but none of this is easy. But it is all about making sure we provide the right environment for women because I want every woman who has had uh, any experience of this nature, who wants to come forward now to feel that they can do that and that they can do that in the right way and get all of the support, including at times confidentiality that they require to enable them to do so. Thank you. We'll take a couple of supplementaries, uh, constituency supplementaries. The first from Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Flaring at Moss Morin has been causing anger, distress and upset amongst many Fife residents in my region. The flare which lights up the sky with a pulsating glow can be seen as far away as Angus. The night sky has been turned to daylight in the areas in Cowdenbeath and Kelty, causing anxiety, sleeplessness and distress. Day after day, residents have had to endure and noise pollution and vib vibrations, not to talk about the impact of quality of air and the environment. Will the First Minister take affirmative action to hold ExxonMobil to account over their unannounced flaring and give my constituents proper answers after months of worry and lack of updates? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say I uh, understand the, the issue that's been raised by the member and have a great deal of sympathy with the concerns uh, that the public are expressing over this situation. And in all issues uh, like this, uh, in due course, if there are issues of accountability, then those must be uh, taken seriously. Here, of course, uh, the regulatory body is uh, SEPA, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. SEPA is uh, very closely engaged in this issue, is looking into it, and I understand that its engagement, uh, engagement includes engaging uh, with the local population. I will ask the Environment Secretary to write to the member updating on uh, the action and investigations that are underway by SEPA, but this is a serious matter uh, that must be uh, properly and transparently resolved. And Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to support Adam Maxwell, who has barely slept since the, since the death of his wife, Kirsty, in Benidorm in April this year, as he and Kirsty's family press for a full investigation into the circumstances of this tragic loss. First Minister. Well, firstly, let me offer my sincere condolences to Mr Maxwell and to all of Kirsty's family uh, on the tragic loss. It is impossible for any of us to imagine uh, what he and his wider family are going through at this time, uh, but they should know my thoughts, and I'm sure the thoughts of everybody across the Parliament are with them. Uh, the Justice Secretary met uh, with the family in September to listen to their concerns. Uh, I understand the investigation by the Spanish authorities into the circumstances surrounding Kirsty's death is still ongoing, and Police Scotland officers continue to offer support to the Spanish authorities. Uh, I can give uh, Alison Johnson the assurance that Police Scotland will continue to liaise closely with the family, uh, or indeed interview any potential witnesses who reside in Scotland. This family uh, deserve answers about what happened to their loved ones, uh, and the police in Scotland will do everything they possibly can to make sure they get them. Brian Whittle. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, following the sudden decision by VG Energy in Galston to enter liquidation, what action the Scottish Government can take to support, to support the firm's 39 staff? First Minister. Well, firstly, this will be uh, an extremely difficult time for uh, the staff of the company concerned, as is always the case in these situations. The Scottish Government will liaise with the company to see if there are any uh, ways in which uh, employment can be protected, but pace. Uh, our approach to supporting people facing redundancy uh, will be, if it's not already, be fully engaged, offering uh, appropriate support to those uh, affected. And uh, I'm sure the Employment Secretary would be happy to discuss the situation uh, further with the member if there are uh, any other issues that he wishes to raise. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Uh, I'm sure the First Minister will join me in wishing a speedy recovery to the police officer stabbed at Edinburgh College on Monday. We all stand together in appreciation of his service and his duty. The case of Elizabeth Bow from my constituency is deeply uh, troubling. It's an issue I've raised repeatedly over recent years since the centralisation of the call centres. And I think it's reasonable to ask these questions because Bilston Glen was at the centre of the N9 crash tragedy where two victims were left dying at the side of the motorway for days because of a shortage of experienced call handlers. Now, Perk have recommended in this particular case that there should be additional training. So can the First Minister give us a guarantee that all the staff at Bilston Glen do have the appropriate experience and that the staff in these, this individual case had the appropriate experience as well? First Minister. Well, firstly, I would join the member in uh, wishing well the police officer who was stabbed earlier this week. We wish him uh, a speedy recovery. That incident, of course, is a reminder of the risks that our police officers take on a, a daily basis as they work hard to keep all of us safe. Uh, secondly, I would uh, say to Willie Rennie, it is, of course, entirely reasonable and legitimate uh, for these questions to be raised. Willie Rennie uh, has indeed raised these issues over a period uh, of time, and that is to his credit. Uh, in terms of the, the Elizabeth Bow case, which uh, I've already had exchanges uh, around with Ruth Davidson, uh, I can give an assurance that all recommendations uh, in the PERC report will be taken forward by Police Scotland uh, and uh, implemented in terms of some of the specifics about individual officers. I, I'm not going to get into detail. I'm happy to ask the Justice Secretary to write uh, to Willie Rennie with more detail uh, if, uh, if he wishes that. But as I said earlier on in response, to uh, Ruth Davidson, the uh, Police Scotland have already uh, taken action uh, to deliver risk and vulnerability training to more than 800 staff. That process uh, will continue. That is about helping staff to better identify and assess risk and to capture all relevant information on calls. So we will continue to make sure that everything that requires to be done uh, following these cases is done. And uh, I will continue to uh, pay close attention to this as First Minister, but the Justice Secretary continues to be engaged on these issues uh, on an ongoing basis. And Willie Rennie. Answer, and I would appreciate some more detailed response from the Justice Secretary in this case because it is particularly important to understand the level of experience of the staff um, at Bilston Glen. It is disturbing, however, that the N9 crash happened over two years ago, but the family have had still not had that fatal accident inquiry that was promised to them at that time. We need to understand what needs to be improved in order for improvements to be made. There are still questions about the underlying reasons for what went wrong in St Andrews. We still don't know what exactly went wrong on the M9. So what guarantees can the First Minister give that we will be told before another tragedy happens? First Minister. Well, firstly, in terms of a fatal accident inquiry, I absolutely understand the desire of the, the, the family in, in that case uh, to have all of the answers to the questions uh, that they have. Uh, as Willie Rennie knows, uh, and you know, it's important that I uh, make this clear, decisions around fatal accident inquiries are not for uh, me as First Minister or indeed for the Justice Secretary. They are for the Crown Office and I'm sure the Lord Advocate would be uh, more than willing to update Willie Rennie on the decision making around a fatal accident inquiry in that uh, case. I do want to though, as I, I, I did to Ruth Davidson, make it absolutely clear and, and make it clear uh, not just for the benefit of those of us in this chamber, but for the benefit of the wider public that there is no sense 
uh, in any of these cases of waiting until fatal accident inquiries before action is taken to learn lessons and address any failings uh, that have been identified. Uh, the work of Her Majesty's Inspector at the work uh, of PERC is hugely important in that regard. And I would uh, repeat what I said to Ruth Davidson. I, again, you know, I, I will stress not seeking in any way to diminish the seriousness of these cases. Uh, but it is the case that significant lessons have been learned, significant improvements have been made. That's been recognised by the inspectorate, and we will continue to make sure uh, that that is the case uh, or in all cases, and that whatever action requires to be taken is taken. So, more supplementaries. The first from Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. In this important week in the run-up to Remembrance Sunday, can I ask the First Minister to outline what support the Scottish Government provides for veterans to make the transition from military to civilian life? My constituency of Stirling has a long and proud connections with the military, but I'm sure veterans across Scotland will be interested to hear the First Minister's response. First Minister. Well, of course, as we uh, approach Remembrance uh, Sunday, uh, the interests uh, and the sacrifices of our armed services and uh, indeed our veterans are very much at the forefront of our minds. Uh, last year, the Scottish Government published a summary of our work uh, to support our armed forces community in Scotland. Uh, next week, indeed, the Veterans Minister will update Parliament fully on this. Uh, we've invested more than a million pounds through the Scottish Veterans Fund since 2008 to support over 140 projects across Scotland, which provide valuable housing, health and employment support for veterans. Uh, we also established a veterans employability group to lead work in this area. And this year we committed five million pounds to ensure that veterans in receipt of social care receive the full value of their war pensions. Uh, although transition issues are reserved, we will continue to give veterans across Scotland the support they deserve. But I think, uh, presiding officer, uh, all, all year round, but particularly at this time of year, I think all of us recognise that nothing we can do of this nature will ever repay fully the debt of gratitude we owe to our armed services and to our veterans community. Graham Day. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, whilst the legal obstacle to the development of four offshore wind farms in the first of Forth and Tay has now been removed, three of the proposed developments, including Inch Cape off the Angus coast, still require contract for different support to proceed. In this offshore wind week, would the First Minister join me in encouraging the UK Government to provide such backing and ensure we are able to take the significant step forward in renewable electricity generation and meeting our climate change obligations? First Minister. Uh, well, I absolutely agree with Graham Day. Uh, we have uh, the Beatrice project now well under construction uh, to be followed by NNG and uh, Murray wind farms in the coming years. And together, these projects are going to provide uh, two gigawatts of renewable energy, plus huge economic benefits for the entire country. Uh, the UK government has committed to a third contract for difference auction in spring 2019, providing an opportunity for the remaining projects in the fourth and Tay to secure a contract which will build on this momentum to deliver uh, a sustainable and inclusive economy uh, for Scotland. We are absolutely committed to protecting our marine environment, which uh, of course is threatened by climate change. So we all need to pay, play our part uh, in tackling this global challenge. Uh, I think it is widely recognised that Scotland is a world leader in this field and we want to make sure that the support is there that ensures that we can continue to be so. Question number four, Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what measures the Scottish Government can put in place to curtail tax avoidance. First Minister. Well, unfortunately, the Scottish Government only has power to directly tackle tax avoidance in relation to two fully devolved taxes, uh, LBTT and the Scottish Landfill Tax. Uh, we take a simple, clear uh, and very robust approach. Uh, we have a uh, general anti-avoidance rule that is wider than the corresponding UK rule. This allows Revenue Scotland to take action against tax avoidance arrangements considered to be artificial, even if they otherwise operate within the law. Now, following recent reports about the use of offshore tax havens, uh, the Finance Secretary has written to the Chancellor seeking urgent reassurance that the UK Government will now take the issue of tax avoidance seriously and demanding that concrete action is now taken. Christine Graham. Uh, I thank the First Minister for her answer, in particular the steps the Scottish Government is taking to reduce tax avoidance. However, does she share my disgust, particularly towards those disclosed in the Paradise Papers, 
whose salaries are paid by the public, like Fiona and Mark Delaney and Paddy Hoolan, actors in the hit show Mrs Brown's Boys, whose wages are paid by the BBC, funded by the licence payers, with them squirrelling away some two million offshore to avoid income tax. And does she agree with me that they should consider disbarring themselves from using, for example, any health service across the UK, which they obviously don't want to pay for, or wouldn't they like that script? First Minister. Well, I think Christine Graham is, is right, and, and the anger that uh, underlies Christine Graham's question there, I'm sure, is shared by the vast majority of people across the UK. You know, people should pay the taxes that they are due uh, to pay. Paying tax is the collective duty that we have uh, to ensure that we have public services that are there for all of us when we need them. Uh, the taxes we pay provide our national health service, they provide our education system, they provide the infrastructure and the other support that our businesses need to prosper and to thrive. So uh, when somebody uh, does uh, something, uh, put, put money into an offshore haven, for example, that is about uh, not paying full tax, they are depriving those public services of the money uh, that they rely on, and that is wrong. Uh, we know that, according to HMRC estimates, the Treasury lost out on £6.9 billion pounds, uh, from evasion and avoidance in 2015-16, uh, and £1.7 billion of that was actually down to tax avoidance. Uh, so for individuals and businesses, tax uh, contributions should be a matter not of what you can get away with, but of respecting uh, the spirit of the law and paying a fair contribution. That would be my message to individuals, but my message to the UK government is that it is within their power to crack down on some of this stuff. And I think it's a matter of, of regret and shame that they have not done so. So hopefully we'll now see some action uh, before the next set of papers uh, are released, no doubt, sometime in the future. Murder Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. While I would accept there's always much more to be done to uh, clamp down on tax avoidance and evasion, I wonder if the First Minister would acknowledge that the tax gap in the UK at 6% is the lowest it has ever been and is amongst the lowest in the world. And I wonder if she would acknowledge that. And on the subject of regret and shame, I wonder if the First Minister now regrets being part of a government that paid £10 million of taxpayers' money to Amazon a company which hardly has an excellent record when it comes to paying tax. First Minister. Well, you know what, if I'd had to guess what MSP would have leapt to their feet today to kind of defend the tax avoiders, I'd probably have put Murdo Fraser quite <laughs> close to the top of that list. You know, yes, OK, we, we can you know, cite figures as Mur Murdo Fraser has just done there. Uh, about the tax gap being less than it is in other countries. But let me repeat what I said earlier on. Close to £7 billion being lost uh, to public services in our country because of tax avoidance and tax evasion. That is unacceptable. And even if uh, Murdo Fraser can't quite bring himself to, to see it and to say so, I think the vast majority of people across the country uh, will do so. And we call on all companies, Amazon included, uh, to pay their due tax. And we call on the UK government, where power on this lies, yeah, to yeah. take the action to ensure yeah, that yeah. people pay the tax that is due. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister correctly points out, companies who participate in tax evasion and tax avoidance uh, reduce the amount of money that goes to public services to address the issues that we talk about week in and week out in this chamber, building a better health service and supporting education. Will the First Minister therefore agree to call in and cancel any public contracts where companies have been shown to have participated in tax avoidance to ensure that all public contracts are awarded to companies who organise their tax affairs in a fair and transparent manner and pay fairly into the public purse. First Minister. Well, I you know, generally agree with the sentiment of the question. As James Kelly knows, we have made uh, significant reforms to public procurement over uh, a number of years uh, to make sure that where companies are benefiting from public contracts, they are expected uh, to behave not just within the letter of the law, but to behave uh, in a way that people would think is acceptable. But I also would hope James Kelly would recognise that the, the powers uh, around uh, tax avoidance uh, and cracking down on tax avoidance principally lie, unfortunately, not in this parliament, but with the UK 
government and I would hope that James Kelly will join us in calling on the UK government to at last do something about it. Andy Whiteman. I thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of reports in the Paradise Papers regarding the St Enoch Centre in Glasgow. She will also be aware that, for example, Edinburgh Airport is owned by a complex structure located in Grand Cayman and Luxembourg, and there is a large rural estate sale currently being negotiated that involves the transfer of shares in an offshore company, thus avoiding land and buildings transaction tax. What additional work is the Scottish Government undertaking to ensure that these risks of tax avoidance by offshore companies are identified and ended? First Minister. Well, we will continue to do everything within our power to try to crack down on this kind of behaviour. I've already spoken about uh, the fact that we have uh, more robust rules in the two taxes uh, where we have responsibility than is the case across the UK. You know, uh, Andy Whiteman is also aware and has a very keen interest in some of the work that we are progressing in the context of land reform to increase transparency with a register of controlling interest. Uh, I really wish this parliament had more power in this area than we do. Unfortunately, we don't. So let those of us who think that is wrong come together, uh, firstly to demand that the UK government takes action that it has so far dragged its feet on taking, but perhaps ultimately calling for these powers to lie in the hands of this parliament so we can have the crackdown that people yeah, want. Yeah. Question number five, Liam Kerr. To ask the First Minister, in light of reports of crews being attacked when dealing with bonfires over the weekend, what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure the safety of emergency responders? First Minister. Well, we, none of us uh, should ever tolerate attacks against firefighters or indeed any member of our emergency services uh, who do a remarkable job in very challenging circumstances. Uh, the Minister for Community Safety visited Dalkeith Fire Station on Tuesday and spoke to firefighters who had been attacked while on duty on bonfire night uh, and thankfully none sustained any significant injuries. Unfortunately, one police officer suffered uh, burns from a firework related attack which I understand to be serious but not life threatening and I'm sure the whole chamber will join me in wishing that officer a speedy recovery. Uh, we fully support the police and our courts in dealing uh, robustly with these offences. Those charged with attacks against our emergency service workers can face a prison sentence, uh, a £10,000 fine or both. Liam Kerr. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Uh, as she points out, last weekend our emergency services were the target of mindless violence. And today there are reports that specialist public order support was demanded by frontline officers, but was refused. And as a result, the officer suffered serious burns from a firework thrown at her face. But the Scottish Government does not collate data on how many of these incidents take place. Therefore, if it doesn't know the scale of the problem, it cannot have any idea whether its solutions will be the right ones. So, as a first step to protecting those who dedicate their lives to protecting us, will the Scottish Government immediately begin gathering and publishing data on the number of assaults that have taken place against the emergency services and commit to an urgent review of resourcing and protective equipment based on that data? First Minister. Yeah. Um, I, I do believe there is work already being progressed uh, around the, the very reasonable issue of, of data that the member has raised, but uh, I will have... Uh, the Justice Secretary or the Minister for Community Safety, who I uh, believe is overseeing this work, write to him with further uh, details. Uh, I think the point about data, not, not just uh, when we're looking at this issue, but generally is, a, is an important and reasonable one. So we will take that forward uh, and uh, reflect on whether further action is required uh, on that front. Uh, more generally, obviously, I've said, and I, I'm sure all of us want to send our uh, sympathies and good wishes to the officer who was injured. I understand Police Scotland had put in, uh, in place a significant amount of planning for bonfire night, uh, a significant number of additional officers had been deployed, uh, double the number normally on duty. Uh, a formal debrief to review these events has been scheduled to ensure that any lessons that required to be learned are learned uh, for the future. But I think all of us should uh, come together, uh, say yes, if there are lessons to be learned, they should be learned. But we should come together to send the clearest of messages. Uh, our emergency services workers put their lives literally on the line each and every day to keep us safe. It is unconscionable um, and awful that anybody could ever contemplate attacking uh, a member of our emergency services while they're going about uh, their duty. And we must condemn that uh, and make clear that there will be zero tolerance towards it. There's a lot of interest in this particular question. Alex Cole-Hamilton. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last year, the anti-social use of fireworks resulted in several convictions for mobbing and rioting in the Muir House area of my constituency. And as Liam Kerr mentioned, this year, a police officer was hospitalised for burns following a direct hit from a firework that deli was deliberately thrown at her. Year on year, we are seeing an escalation in this kind of behaviour. Does the First Minister agree that as well as a a mature discussion around the licensing of private firework use. We also need to dramatically invest funding in detached and sessional youth work in areas like Muir House as a means of diverting young people from this kind of activity in the first place. First Minister. Um, yes, I do. I, I think that is a, a reasonable point to make. I think there's a number of things we need to do. Uh, firstly, to make sure that our police officers, our firefighters are properly resourced on and around occasions like bonfire night. I've already said there were a uh, I think double the number of officers normally uh, on duty uh, who were on duty on bonfire night given some of the disorder we've seen uh, previously. Um, I also think that it is uh, a discussion to be had and probably uh, a look required at uh, the rules and regulations and laws around uh, both the sale of, of fireworks and uh, the permitted use of fireworks. Uh, there is, as the member will be aware, split responsibility between this Parliament and the Westminster Parliament. Uh, the Scottish Government has responsibility for legislation on the use of fireworks, but it's uh, reserved to Westminster uh, in terms of sale and possession of fireworks. But I will not be, in fact, I, I'm sure there's nobody in this chamber who hasn't had concerns raised by constituents this week uh, about firework use. So the Scottish Government will certainly uh, take a look at uh, where we have powers, whether we should uh, do any more or take any further action. But finally, the, the point Alec Cole Hamilton raises about diversion, not just in this context but more generally is an important one and those uh, I've already praised and, and paid tribute to our emergency service workers but we also need to pay tribute to those who do work, uh, youth workers who work with our young people uh, seeking to engage them uh, in more productive uh, conduct than some of the conduct we're speaking about and that's uh, a valid point to make. Neil Findlay. Can I support everything the First Minister has said about attacks on uh, fire service crew but attacks on the fire service come in many guises. And can we also condemn any proposals to reduce fire service numbers and close fire stations? Because these are a further attack on the fire service. So will she commit today to halt any proposals that may come forward in the future that would reduce fire service jobs and reduce the number of fire stations? First Minister. Well, we will continue to take action to protect uh, the front line of our fire service to do the job that they are there to do. Um, there have been no closures of uh, fire stations since the reform of the uh, fire service took place. It is absolutely right that the fire service, uh, given the changing demands on them, uh, look at uh, the action they have to take to make sure that our firefighters are properly equipped uh, to do the job that we expect them to do. But as we see in this year's budget, where we have uh, actually increased the revenue uh, operating budget of the fire service, we will continue to work with the fire service to make sure that they are equipped to do the vital job uh, that all of us depend on them doing. Question number six, Rhoda Grant. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding reports that the UK could leave the Common Agricultural Policy and the Common Fisheries Policy in March 2019 with no transition period. First Minister. Well, on Monday, the Rural Economy and Environment Secretaries met uh, the DEFRA Secretary of State along with the Welsh Cabinet Secretary for uh, Rural Affairs. Uh, during the meeting, they pressed uh, the Secretary of State on the issue of transition for the Common Agricultural Policy and the Common Fisheries Policy. Uh, the UK Government at that meeting was not able to give any clear position at all. Uh, farmers and fishermen need to know what regime they will be operating under in less than 18 months' time, and it is simply unacceptable that the UK Government has so far been unable to provide the clarity that has been requested and that is required. We will continue to press uh, DEFRA and UK Ministers on this critical issue in the coming weeks. Rhoda Grant. The First Minister knows that many of our fishers and farmers depend on access to UK markets to sell their produce and also on EU subsidies to make, to make our food more affordable and to protect the environment. What steps can she take to provide them with some comfort that that will continue uh, post uh, March 2019? First well, we will do everything we can uh, to, to make sure that the support that our farmers and our fishermen uh, depend on continues uh, after the UK leaves the European Union. But uh, right now, it is the UK government that requires to provide that clarity. We don't even know right now 
uh, whether cap and the common fisheries policy will continue for a transitional period or, or whether the UK will exit uh, at the point of Brexit in March uh, 2019. I mean, just to underline uh, the confusion that reigns in the UK government, I mean, here's two quotes, a matter of days apart. Lord Duncan uh, from the Scotland office speaking to the NFU said, the Secretary of State, i.e. Michael Gove, has been very clear that he believes farming and fishing should not be part of any transitional deal. Michael Gove, five days later, Certainly a transition period of around two years will follow. And I have some thoughts about what might happen to CAP during that period. It is unconscionable that our farmers and fishermen who, as the member said, do rely so much on these EU subsidies still have no clarity whatsoever. And I hope everybody across this chamber will join with us in putting pressure on the UK government to resolve this situation and give the clarity that is so urgently needed. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We now move on to members' business in the name of Gillian Martin. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.